Hello, everyone. Welcome to Literary Lights, a monthly reading series organized by the International Armenian Literary Alliance, the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, and the Krikor and Clara Zorab Information Center. Thank you to the Armenian Bar Association and Anahid Ugurlayan for co-sponsoring this event. I'm Judy Sarian, um, and on behalf of Nasser, I'd like to welcome you all. Today, Literary Lights features The Fear of Large and Small Nations by Nancy Agabian, who will be in conversation with Aida Zilelian. Nancy will be donating all her book sales for the month of November to the Women's Support Center in Armenia, which has been supporting women and families forcibly displaced from Artsakh. Aida Zilelian is a writer, educator, and storyteller. Her first novel, The Legacy of Lost Things, was the recipient of the Tololian Literary Award. She's been featured in the Huffington Post, NPR's Takeaway, Poets and Writers, Kirkus Reviews, among other reading series and print outlets. Her short story collection, These Hills Were Meant for You, was shortlisted for the Catherine Ann Porter Prize in short fiction. And last year, her short story, The Piano, won the first prize in the Lighthouse, Week, Lighthouse Weekly Contest. Ida has been performing at storytelling venues in New York City and most recently in Montreal. All the Ways We Lied, her most recent novel, is slated for release in January 2024 and will be one of the opening Literary Lights programs for next year. Please get your copy when it is released so that you'll be ready for this wonderful event. And now I pass the mic over to Ida. Hi, thank you for the intro. Hello, everyone. Um, there's so much I want to say about Nancy's fabulous novel. And I think what I'd like to do is just start with her formal introduction, her formal bio, and then I want to talk a little bit about Nancy and the book. Nancy Agabian's previous books include Me Is Her Again, True Stories of an Armenian Daughter, a memoir honored as a Lambda Literary Award finalist for LGBT nonfiction, and shortlisted for a William Soroyan International Writing Prize, and Princess Freak, a collection of poetry and performance art texts. In 2021, she was awarded Lambda Literary Foundation's Jean Cordova Prize for Lesbian Queer Nonfiction. The Fear of Large and Small Nations is Nancy's first novel, which was a finalist for the Penn Bellwether Prize for Socially Engaged Fiction. So this is very special for me because Nancy and I have been friends for so long. The first time I met her is when she gave me the voice and space to read for her reading series, Gartal, at Cornelia Street Cafe. So this is especially fun for me because we're really good friends. And if you haven't read uh, our interview in Craft, definitely check it out. So I'll talk a little bit about the book. What struck me as I was reading your novel, Nancy, was the storytelling. It was textured in such a way where you wove this tapestry with meta writing, journaling, blog posts, and it gave this very personal first person perspective. And then there were the more objective moments in the book labeled as story, which were written in third person, where we look at the main character, Na, from a completely different perspective. And through all of this, you're traveling time. You're in Armenia. We're looking at Na's exploration of Armenia, the rich history of culture and personal connection she has as a diasporan. We're taken to a story in New York, which is where Na is contending with the destructiveness of the relationship that she finds her in. And this resonates very deeply because she's a feminist and it shows how culture contends with the silence of domestic abuse. Um, 
There is also this overpowering sense of bewilderment that the character is experiencing. There's so much exploration here as well. She's connecting to her homeland. She's connecting to herself as a feminist. And then with a person who ultimately becomes this really destructive force in her life. I'm not going to give away the ending, but I will say that Na's reflections of all that happened to her are so clear-eyed and wise, so objective in understanding the complexity of relationships. There is psychological insight in connections to ourselves as well as our culture. And really, it leaves, I think, the reader feeling comforted by all of these really powerful reflections. And that's what I wanted to say about this amazing, amazing novel. Thank you so much, Ida. Yeah, I love you. It's so nice to do this together. And I wanted to say it's special to have a friend who, you know, you connect on the Armenian level and then we've been friends through the Queen's writers community. So uh, that's been special too. And um, and I think I've told you this and I've announced it publicly before too, but you read, I think, like the first third of this in process. And it was super encouraging when you talk to me about it because I admire you so much as a fiction writer and I didn't know if I could tell a story in this fictionalized way and your encouragement really helped and I'm so I'm excited to talk about the book with you today um and I did want to very briefly thank everyone here um and thank our um, co-sponsors. I feel like um, I've been going to NASA since I was a kid and my aunt was a charter member and so I feel like I've arrived and Zorab Center likewise has been so supportive to New York writers um, and amazing to have them involved. And of course, Yala, um, with all the support over the years and um, the incredible promotion and platforming you do of Armenian and Artsakh writers. And finally, Armenian Bar um, and Anahid, um, thank you so much for bringing this book into your work. Um, it, all these women today are actually a dream team of friends and who have really supported this book. And I could go on and on the whole hour talking about them, but I'll move on to talk about a little bit about what I'll read today. So, um, you know, this has been such a difficult time. It goes without saying that witnessing um, what's happened to Artsakh, the um, ethnic cleansing and genocide, the blockade has been incredibly painful um, and followed up with the violence in Israel and Palestine and the unfolding genocide in Gaza. It's just um, an unfathomable time. And um, this book does contain violence and it it did makes it does make sense to talk about that aspect of it within the moment but it's actually been in the works for a long time that um when i in in the final you know lead up to launching the book when I started to have to think about how do I promote this book. Um, I thought about people who I really wanted to talk about this with and many of them are here. Um, and I did reach out to Anahid Ugarlayan, um because of the work 
that the Armenian bar has done with domestic violence. Um, and this kind of reaching out um, has been helpful to me. I should say I've been like, before the book came out, I was really, really nervous because um, even though it's a novel, it is based on my, my personal story with intimate partner violence. And uh, I can't tell you how scared I was. Um, and I wanted to say it's been amazing to see that I've come this far that I can speak openly about it. Um, and I ascribe that to just the power of writing and speaking out and as a form of healing. And of course, I think we all know this in some way. If we're not writers, then we've heard about it. And I'm a teacher and I talk about it. And yet still, I had this incredible fear and uh, I still needed to be taught that lesson that um, writing and and reading and speaking is a form of healing. And of course, I couldn't have imagined, um, you know, when you write a book, you don't really imagine what the landscape is going to be like. And so I didn't know that I would be doing a reading for the LA community during a time when um, homophobia was erupting in the Glendale Armenian community, for example, and of course couldn't know the situation that we've landed in now with, with genocide all around us. It's been dizzying and overwhelming, and there have been many times when I haven't had words and many times when I haven't felt like speaking. Um, so the piece that I want to read to you today is directly about this, about speaking out and healing from violence. Um, I need to do a little bit of setup that um, this is from a chapter called Sorry About the Violence. Um, and just to orient you within the chapter, Na and Sadon, the two main characters, are witnessing a domestic violence situation with their upstairs neighbors. And Na doesn't, Na feels powerless and doesn't know what to do about it. Meanwhile, in her journal that she writes in New York, five years into the future where she's trying to extricate herself from an abusive relationship, um, she's writing about it and she's also getting ready to do a performance about domestic violence in Armenia. On her way to her rehearsal, Sedan is Skyping with his parents in Armenia and he wants her to say something to them in Armenian. And to her surprise, she starts crying. Um, so just the, there's references to this stuff in the segment I'm gonna read. But also I wanted to say this, the book takes place between 2006 and 2011 at a time when corruption was the main issue of concern in Armenia. And we all know the situation has improved over time since then. Um, but I think the pressure that we see within Armenia and the pressure within Artsakh um, and all the pressures Armenians have been under to survive amidst brutality and imperialism, that this is also part of the story, you know, of course, as it was, you know, during the time of the novel, during now, during 1915. Um, so what I'll be reading is, a it's called a meta writing. It's one of the passages that gets woven throughout the novel. And it's where Na kind of 
puts all the pieces together. Um, if you have the book and want to read along, it's page 208. Tanya once surmised to me that Armenia doesn't have a record of mass shooters exterminating people in public or serial killers systematically butchering strangers to store in their freezers. Because we speak to each other so harshly, we let everything come out. There's always someone around to receive your rage. Neighbors don't do anything when they hear a woman's cries because it happens behind closed doors within the family unit. The government is not motivated to stop it. Why take responsibility for the incredible pressures that poor living conditions and unfulfilled lives have put on families? Let them lash out at each other instead of tearing the corrupt government down. They even use the same language of shame with journalists and NGOs. Don't tell the Europeans or the Americans about human rights violations or we won't receive foreign investment. How is this difficult from telling a woman not to contact the authorities about being abused, lest your family look bad to others, suffering for the good of your family, your country? So I thought I could see the problems of society. I was also subject to those problems, as well as being vulnerable to my own madness. Instead of realizing that hurt was coming to me from the relationship, I believed I had taken it on so that I could write about it. However, it was only through writing about it that I could attempt to understand the complex mess it entailed. I think about the moment when I cried while speak, speaking to Sadon's parents. His mother could see our accumulating stress, the point when our troubles were revealed. It wasn't the picture Sadon wanted to project to his parents. We never discussed whatever happened to him as a child, even when I inserted these details into my performance. He has scars on his arms and face, and I am not sure where they came from. I asked when we were first getting to know each other, and I half remember his stories about an apple knife slipping to explain the shiny, hairless gash in his forearm and roughhousing with his brother for the deep, narrow marks on his face. In New York, he got an eye piercing by the one near his eyebrow, covering it up. I sensed that I should never pry. When he said I should give the woman upstairs chocolate and ask if she needed help, was it because I had not made it clear to him that I would listen and help him? Was it evident that I just wanted a simple fix to give her the number and move on and that I was wrapped up in my own American version of reality? After all, he was performing a persona he thought I would like. When he didn't affirm my reality, I was deeply disturbed. I was so upset with him for not wanting to give her the phone number of the shelter, but perhaps he couldn't imagine the shelter, an official entity, coming to her aid when such a possibility hadn't been available to him when he had been abused by his family. Meanwhile, Sadon didn't mind me writing about our violence on my blog and again in the woman's workshop, perhaps because I was taking the blame for it. He was the one who had been abused as a child, but now he could appear powerful and I could be humiliated. A part of me hoped he would stop once I exposed the behavior, but maybe my writing about him gave an excuse to not open up to me. Why would he when I would project his vulnerabilities to the world? Running the work by him gave him control and perhaps his familial history with abuse was worse than anything I could represent or imagine. One last excerpt from my performance. I am visiting his family in Yerevan three years after we moved to New York. His father has a knife and he is pretending to throw it at his mother. Then there is the playful head push or the grabbing of the ear. She does not do anything like this to him. She pushes him away and announces that he must have been drinking. 
I was reading what I saw as clues, and it never occurred to me that I should say something to his father, to his mother, or to him. I felt safer putting details like this into a performance rather than taking action. An audience watched and did not hold me responsible for my decision, providing tacit approval. Action would have entailed that I end the relationship, but I felt responsible for Seiran's emotional and physical abuse. Why? I suppose when you grow up feeling for the feeling responsible for the results of genocide, you feel responsible for just about anything. I felt responsible for losing my culture and heritage when the process of assimilation was already long in force for two generations before I was born. I felt double guilt for losing my culture and for not wanting it back. As a child, America constantly sent messages that to be Armenian, to be brown and ethnic and foreign was dirty and wrong, a weakness. As an adult, those layers slid against each other, obscuring some realities while clarifying others. I felt responsible for Sadon because I felt responsible for my family's history projected onto him. When I couldn't speak Armenian to help my neighbor, when I couldn't repeat a joke in Armenian, I felt the disgrace of my failed identity to help others to be Armenian. It compound, compounded over time, exacerbated by emotional abuse and exploded into a snarl of emotion without warning. I became enraged and undone. Even though I didn't leave him then, my performance was not inconsequential. Something inside me shifted so that I eventually gained agency. Owning my family history with violence made a difference. Or it could be that silence must be transformed to language before it arrives at action, as, as Audre Lorde suggests. So I'll close there. Thank you, Nancy. Um, you really chose such a powerful moment to share. So why don't we go back to one of the things that really impressed me, which was how you structured your book. Um, my first question is, how did the book evolve? And how did the structure of the book evolve? You know, my, as I've already um, mentioned, and my story overlaps with Na's story. I did go to live in Armenia for a year. Um, I did get into a destructive relationship and I did keep a blog. Um, and I, um, you know, Na, my character, the characters based on me, is bisexual, she's very idealistic, and she wants to go to Armenia because she's dismayed with the political situation in the U.S. In 2006, it was um, the second Bush administration and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were upsetting for her and she realizes there's like change underfoot in Armenia and wants to write about artists and activists and feminists, et cetera, queer people uh, working for social change. Um, so I, you know, that, you know, Sadon enters at this point and he's facing a military conscription into the uh, the Armenian military and which has been known to be brutal, especially for people who are different. Um, he's also bisexual. It seems like he really sees her for who she is and that's how the relationship starts. And as you described, in your intro, it breaks apart. Um, and 
so the you know as a writer um i had these blog posts that i knew i wanted to write about armenia and i thought i could add to them um to tell a story about armenia at that time so i saw it as kind of like a reported book like a non creative nonfiction book. And so every I wrote everything in first person. But as I was writing um, stuff about the relationship, my current situation in New York was seeping in. And I didn't know if I wanted to write about it, but my friends encouraged me to that they saw it was part of the story. And as I was working along, I was writing about this time in Armenia, which it was this weird phenomenon where I would like see myself in third person. Like I was like, see myself from above. It wasn't like I was dissociating. It was just how I thought like, like, wow, this is my life now. And um, almost like narrating about myself in a movie and so I tried this and and wrote what this was like and uh again the writing group was like this is working um and it helped me a lot to tell the story because I did have so much shame that I, I couldn't even really voice what was going on but to talk about it and write about it in third person gave me space and distance and it also, you know, eventually helped me when I needed to fictionalize to put the story together. The other kinds of pieces of it, the journal entry, um, I think I just probably at one point I was like, I just probably cut and pasted my journal entry into a chapter because I was like, well, this says what is happening. And then realized that this could be um, a vehicle to tell her story through this intimate format and have a more intimate voice. So that's how all the three came together. And then the meta writing, which I just read, it's very much like what I'm used to as a nonfiction writer is you try to make sense of what you've been through and you reflect and analyze. So um, I, I also wanna say like, I was influenced by artists in Armenia who were working with collage and using other resources to tell their stories and their truths. And it felt like having a public voice like the blog voice and the personal voice together um really reflected like this fracturing of public and private lives in this post-soviet reality and as a performance artist i was used to sort of switching gears um you know i also one time I did an interview and the interviewer asked the same question and she was like, yeah, but how did you do it? Like, she really wanted to know, like, technically, yeah. how did I do it? And uh, there were a lot of index cards involved of like <laughs> charting what each section did, moving things around. That's just what I, yeah, that's what I wanted to know. Wow. Okay. Because how do you know? when to use what mode of storytelling sorry to interrupt but that's really the driving question how did you know i better this is in this moment of the book i'm gonna write through this lens and i'm gonna use this instead that that's great I, it did i mean at some point i decided that most of the third person story passages would be about armenia and sometimes i switched um you know because i I to New York because third person in New York be, because of the content. Mm -hmm. So I did try to set up basic rules so that readers wouldn't be so confused. 
it's like oftentimes a chapter starts with a blog post like that was something that I got from a reader in my feedback group like saying I need to be grounded and so orienting people with the blog post each time became an easy decision for me yeah but um like I said the the third person was really what clicked it all into place because I I think Ida, like, I don't know how you write, but for me, it was really intuitive. Like, I just trusted that, like, I didn't sit down and say, I have these five themes about diaspora that I really want to cover in this book and write. Mm -hmm. And it just, I let, I just had faith that themes would evolve and um, and my process is a lot about cut, 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 cut away, like put everything together and then carve it away um, as the themes emerge. That was, I'm so glad, I'm so glad to hear all this because I was really wondering how much of it was intuitive and planned. So it looks like it was a, a little bit of both. I do want to move on to the next question because it is about the silence of domestic violence in our community. And I wanted to ask how you found yourself breaking the silence on this topic. Yeah, um, it, it was hard because I was thinking about it that I don't think I've had a friend, Armenian or otherwise, um, tell me um very few um have told me i've been experiencing or i experienced a, um physical emotional or sexual abuse sometimes emotional but i think reading really helped when i read about narcissism and codependence and their link um, that really helped a lot because it made me feel not crazy. I think I had to figure out that before I could determine what I'd been through was abusive and it and it was a real gradual process. Um, your book, Legacy of Lost Things, there is a depiction of an abusive a domestic violence situation and as I've told you that book I love that book for many reasons and you know couldn't put it down when I picked it up um and I and I think you you know in that book you broke a silence and that really matters that we have that depiction um I think, you know, when I, I mean, Armenia itself, I, I I think, you know, at some point when I could say, okay, this was an abusive relationship, then I could say, what does, what does writing about this relationship convey about Armenia and Armenians in diaspora and homeland? And then it became the situation where the, the relationship and the writing about Armenia kind of played off of each other. So because I of uh, because of intergenerational trauma and internalized oppression and how that leads to violence, um that that was the other piece that, that moved the story along and, and helped me. I think giving myself space to say this is a complex situation mm -hmm. um, that that helps over time. Um, yeah. Yeah, because there are far more gray areas when it comes to this topic that it really is not black and white. And so you never know where you really are in all of it. Can we move on to the next question? Sure. Okay. So, so much has happened since the release of your book for you personally, as well as in present day Armenia. How much would you say that has changed the way that you view your book? 
Um, so, you know, as I did today, when I, I, I feel like I have to explain where Armenia was then versus now. It's like, I don't want people to misjudge Armenia is a big thing. Like, don't misjudge what's happening now for what was happening then. Um, so much of the book is about wanting change, like Na wants to change and feel stuck. Armenia wanted to change and felt stuck, felt like people kept saying to me, oh, it's going to take two generations to change. And now I think we're in this moment of, I think so many of us feel silenced. Um, I think there is still so much silence about violence in relationships and families. And then we saw this enormous of violence erupt on Artsakh Armenians and, you know, how I think, how can we be heard? You know, I think systems of oppression are rely on silence. And I think that's why Me Too was such a watershed moment. Mm -hmm. And the world relies on Armenians to be silent, like the powerful forces that be. Um, so I guess that I, I, so much when I was right, you know, as I was like maybe halfway through and getting determined that I wanted to publish this, I think so much of it was, I felt like unpacking shame Mm -hmm. That if the book could encourage people to unpack shame, that that could be, you know, a way of healing internalized oppression and the and our internalized trauma. And but then, you know, watching what's been happening, it's I feel like that can't be the answer to everything. There are so many things we're not responsible for, we're not responsible for this world situation where power is so important and we get, Armenia gets an Artsakh got trapped in this horrible geopolitical mess. But I still think that, um, you know, it's important too, you know, doing that internal work is still important alongside the external work. Like if we don't grieve and mourn, we can't find a way to act sometimes. It's like, sometimes we're, we're so focused on acting and, and saying, we need recognition for the genocide of 1915. We don't take time to mourn. And so I think there's more power in voicing yourself than looking inside sometimes too. Sometimes people yeah. feel more power in acting instead of working on what they need to work on. It's a way of deflecting that people do at times also for sure. They go kind of hand in hand and we toggle between them, but they're both really necessary, I think, for our healing and for change in the world around us. It is definitely about striking that balance. Um, I wanted to ask, and this was a question that I asked in craft. I want to make sure I'm re reading it though, like exactly the way. Um, how much of your novel would you consider a love story? Yeah, I I I liked when you asked that question in craft and um when I when I was telling people about it for a while, I was calling it an anti-love story. Um, you see, uh, you do see a love story develop at the same time you see it crumble apart. Um, I think Na was seeking a love story instead of love. And yet there is love 
you know, there there's um, a gay male couple from Armenia that she's friends with, Mardi and Garib, and there's a lot of love among them and talking about what they're going through. So um, the women's writing workshops that she teaches in Armenia, there's a lot of love evolves there. Um, Armenia itself, there's so much love expressed for community and communality. And I think there's this self-love that that's part of Na's journey is realizing, um, you know, cultural loss doesn't make her unlovable and that actually what you do with loss is lovable. So that that's how I think of it. Yeah, it's not a classic love story in the romantic <laughs> sense, but it's love in every other sense except for romance. I get it. Yeah. And Absolutely. and Bell Hooks writes about that, um, you know, the importance for feminists especially to think about love in different ways besides relationship love. And so that influenced me too. Um, let's talk a little bit about me as her again and what aspects, I don't know who has read me as her again, but it is poignant and funny among many other things. And if you are even just, if, if you're not even the diaspora, you can connect, even if you're not American army, you can connect to so much of this. What aspects of me as her again, do you think resonate with this most recent novel? I when I what I was trying to do with me as her again was like reconcile a queer identity with Armenian identity. And at that time when I was writing it to it's a memoir. I was writing it in 2000 and 2005 and I it was a very different situation for LGBT Armenians, I think. Um, trying to gain acceptance by the community. We're still trying to do that, but I think it was much less visible and um, expressed publicly. And at the same time, I think Armenians seeking recognition for the genocide, I felt like there was a lot of interplay between those things. Um, and I, I certainly wanted that, that I wanted that kind of acceptance from my family and had kind of couldn't understand why when Armenians had been oppressed, why they couldn't see another oppressed group. But there's a, a moment of mourning in that book when I was, I tried to imagine my grandmother's genocide story and write it like a fictional piece with the characters and what they went through. And when I got to the point of my great grandfather being taken away, arrested and killed, I didn't expect, I just had a flood of sobbing. And I wrote about that in Me as Her again that I didn't know, it sounds stupid, but I didn't know that I needed to mourn that history. I, I mean, I knew what my grandmother had been through. I was sad about it. I was drawn to it. I wanted to know what happened to it. I wanted to figure things out, wanted to figure out how it affected my family. But that moment of grieving, something I didn't know how to grieve, I think that's in the fear of large and small nations. And it, and it came out in the excerpt I read, this idea that why am I feeling so responsible for assimilation? Like I'm grieving my cultural loss, but how much am I responsible for it? I do have some responsibility, but that aha moment of, well, it's gone on for two generations before I was born. Um, that feels like a kind of grief too. And so I think maybe it's where I'm at in my life that I'm seeing things so much through a grief lens. But I think um, 
giving ourselves space to grieve is important. And I think a, a lot of Armenians feel that sense of grief. You hear stories, you've never experienced this, but experiencing the story makes it part of our personal narrative. And I think we take it in um, and we have no choice, not all of us, but some of us to grieve it. Like I never met my uh, grandfather actually, and he was orphaned in the genocide at the age of four in a little town called Zile, which I recently found about. And he survived and he made it here, but he died very, very young because he'd had a very hard life. And I had to mourn that in a different way. His being orphaned, his family being killed in front of, you know, we all, we don't need to meet people to grieve for them and their, and yeah. their stories. Yeah. yeah. Um, would you like to share one of your favorite moments from the book? Can we do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so I thought I would read it if there's time. I think so. It's a couple paragraphs. It looks like we have time and then we should, we could open up the q and I already see that one person has something posted. So please, everyone, post whatever you like and please let me know if you want to be the one to ask that question yourself, put it in parentheses, or if you would like for me to read the question to Nancy. All right, I'm gonna mute myself. Okay, I'll, I'll read the, it's a, it's a, I had mentioned the writing workshop, the women's writing workshop. Um, so this is about that. A few years later, Nawal returned to teach another workshop for women, only a few sessions long, specifically centered on the female body. In this workshop attended by women who are straight, gay, pregnant, old and young, they will bond immediately. They will sit in the garden behind the center and talk about rites of passage, menstruation, marriage, family, love, sexuality, pregnancy, relationships, menopause, and death. One woman leads them in yoga and they stretch toward the sky, toward each other. In the workshop, Na starts writing about the physical abuse in her relationship. Though no one else writes about such experiences, no one bats an eye when she reads the words aloud. Later, the whole group will read to an audience, including Na. A few people comment on what she wrote, indicating that they heard it understood it and appreciated it, and no one condemns her. Her words traveling in time from the moment of abuse in her apartment through her body into the space underneath the grape barber amid the accepting energy of the group. She releases some of her shame. On her last night in Yerevan, the women from this workshop come over to the apartment she, where she was staying and throw a party. They bring flowers. One woman was formerly a florist and chose Na how to strip a stem of leaves and arrange it in a vase. Another woman shows her how to make Armenian coffee. They drink wine and eat sweets and talk about writing, about life. They are celebrating creativity and their connections with each other. They, they take group photos by her arched Soviet window, feeling jubilant. Na doesn't think she has ever felt happier in her whole life. This is what it means to take someone's pain away. That's the last line of the chapter that comes off of the idea of tzavadhanam. I'll take your pain away. I was going to say, yes, tzavadhanam. And what I was going to, my follow-up question was going to be before we open up the Q&A, why did you choose that? I It's very obvious that you read that and it made me happy to hear you read it. I totally understand why you chose that. That's a lovely description and moment. Thank you. Yeah. Um. Okay. I will start with a question by Alan Whitehorn. Thanks, Nancy. As an Armenian American author, do you find that in both the US and in Armenia, you are simultaneously, sorry, an insider outsider who never fully integrates in either? And if so, does this foster being an observer slash writer? I ask this as an, as an Armenian Canadian who's been involved in both countries in a variety of ways. 
Yeah, I think that's so true for so many folks, that insider, outsider feeling of whatever country you're from. I, so much of the experience of being American, um, that there's this whole story going on and you don't get represented in it. And so it automatically puts you in an observer position. I could go into detail about how dismayed I have felt over these last oh. few weeks, oh. but that, you know, but I won't because <laughs> it, it'll, it's, it's, I think other people feel it too, that our leaders we saw it with Artsakh and we're seeing it now with Israel and Palestine. What our leaders are saying does not align and seeing like different terms being applied for, you know, convenience sake, calling something a war when it's really a genocide. I think that also puts us on the outside too. Somebody asked, have you visited Armenia, Yerevan recently, and how does it feel and look like compared to the time frame of the novel? I did visit in August of this year, um, and I, I have visited since that 2006 trip, so I have different glimpses um, through the years, and um of course it's really changed like uh, so much on a surface level just like what traffic looks like and thing what businesses look like um what people look like and it does in my brief time there i guess what i always kind of seek out is this feeling of community and communality and that's still there that remains but it was you know obviously going in August during the height of the blockade it was very very tense and it you could feel that enormous pressure on people's lives and it did feel similar to 2006 when corruption was the huge pressure um this out, outside pressure and this threat of violence was very you know very much part of the fabric of being there. And how long were you there, did you say? I was there just, I don't, 10 days? It was, was short. It, was it for the Tumanyan Storytelling Festival? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, which was a beautiful event. Yeah. And a, a lot of um, sharing of stories that were really powerful and um, important at that time. Somebody, Lori, wanted to know what is missing in or from our voices? What? <laughs> <laughs> what is missing in or from our voices? Uh, I don't know. There's so much, I think, um, that we, I think there's so much that we swallow. I mean, I, I don't know, it's hard to talk in the generalities. Cause yeah, it's a big question. It's such a big question. I think. In our literary voices, I that's how I'm interpreting it. I I think the publishing industry has wanted us to publish on genocide. I think it's a story they understand, but we have processed it a lot too. Um and I think maybe just different viewpoints, Lori, that um, you know, from different diaspora. You know, we haven't heard from um, Syrian diaspora too much, and they've been through a lot. And I think you could say that about any 
of the, our diasporas that are Ameri in, our, in English anyway, our Armenian American voices are dominating, but I think I'm not, a, have... I'm not a lit Armenian literature professor. I wish wish I was. I could answer that better. I was gonna say maybe that's why it's so hard too, because how you know you have to know a, quite a breath, which I know you do, but it's still a hard question. I think this may be our last one, but we're open to others. Nancy, there is such a layering of form and voice in your novel. In what ways do you feel that you consciously queer form in your writing? Yeah, that's it is such a big thing for me because I I feel like, you know, there's this sort of Western way of telling a story with the narrative arc and everything. And it is a big question for me, like, well, how would I tell my story in a more authentic way? And I think in terms of being queer and telling stories through our experiences, through the body, through love through um, reminding people there are other realities. Um, that was part of why I wanted to tell a story in kind of a collaged way that like a, that multiplicity of voices I felt as a kind of querying of form, even though it's all Nas voice, it's different elements of her voice. So I hope it gives space for anyone, um, whatever silences people have that this kind of breaking down of form can mm -hmm. help tell a story. I think this really may be our last question, but you never know as you're answering. Um, interested in the words thing. How now politicians can't say ceasefire, but can say humanitarian pause. And who decides what is okay or not? Yeah, I think that gets into like George Orwell in 1984, you know, like we've seen this documented through doublespeak and that's all it makes me think of. Um, and we watch language being co-opted in so many different ways. Um, and it's like an ongoing conversation and issue. Very much, very much. Um, I think that that would be the last question. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say, Nancy? Oh, I don't think so. We could, I think we could. Yeah, I think we did too. I <laughs> wanted to actually bring in Anahid now. Thank you so much. This was a great conversation. Hi, Anahid. Hi. Well, on behalf of the Armenian Bar Association's Domestic Violence uh, Committee, uh, I want to thank uh, Nancy and uh, Yala for inviting us to co-sponsor this event. Uh, I was fortunate to receive an advanced copy of the novel, and I was just awestruck by Nancy's courage uh, to share her painful yet triumphant experience. We need to face uncomfortable truths. We Armenians pride ourselves in telling each other and the world um, you know, about our successes, but uh, we want to keep hidden the ugly parts of ourselves, things that are common uh, to all communities. Domestic violence is no exception. It's time to set aside the amot, as uh, Nancy said earlier, and, uh, and work together to educate our community, help survivors, uh, and work to eradicate it. Uh, so thank you to uh, Nancy and Ida, who both happen to be dear friends of mine, uh, for this uh, illuminating discussion, and we look forward to supporting similar programs in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Anahid and, and the Armenian Bar Association for co-sponsoring this event. Uh, thank you to Judy Saryan at Nasser and Jesse Arlen at the Zorab Center, who have been such wonderful partners in championing Armenian literature. Thank you, Ida, for hosting this event with such thoughtfulness and, and insight. Uh, I encourage everyone to pre-order her next novel, All the Ways We Lied.
you can find links in the chat. Nancy, Nancy, thank you for having the courage to share this story with us. Nancy is such a generous writer, generous with her empathy for her characters, uh, which I which I really, really admire. I don't think I would have been able to be so, so empathetic. Um, and And there were so many moments in this novel where Nancy elucidated eloquently, you know, complex issues that I had thought about and experienced, but never had been able to express. Um, there are so many lines I underlined and starred, and I know I'm going to return to this story again and again. Um, Nancy will be donating her book sales for the month of November to the Women's Support Center in Armenia, uh, which has been supporting women and their families forcibly displaced from Artsakh. So if you haven't bought a book, do so today. Uh, your your um, the, the money for the book will go to a very, very good cause. You can also find links in the chat for that. Uh, join us on December 3rd uh, to discuss Mashinka Furen Tagopian's book, The Institute for Other Intelligences. Uh, check our website for event details soon. And please take a minute to fill out the survey, uh, which will pop up on your screen when you exit. Thank you all um, and happy reading. Good night. <laughs>